Welcome to episode number 69 of the Animals at Home podcast. My name is Dylan Perrin. Thank you very much for joining me. This is the podcast that inspires others to push the limits of their reptile husbandry by promoting the importance of high-level creative care individualized for each reptile. So if you do follow me on Instagram at Animals at Home CA or a subscriber on YouTube, you would have seen this. But a couple of weeks ago, I added a large pond into my Brazilian rainbow boa enclosure. Now, of course, she's always had a large wa- or access to a large water dish, but this pond is a lot bigger than any water dish she's had before. It's quite a bit longer and it's much, much deeper. It's probably about six inches deep or so. So last week, I fed her for the first time in this new setup, and she did this incredibly interesting thing where as soon as she finished eating, she went into the pond, and I hadn't even really seen her interact with the pond. I hadn't seen her drink out of it or anything, so she instinctively knew it was there and went and hung out in there for many, many hours. So that was incredibly interesting, and again, it's another piece of evidence or anecdotal evidence, I guess, that suggests as you add more items to the enclosure that replicate nature, your animals will start behaving in ways that they are programmed to behave. I had no idea that she would do this or I was not expecting her to do this at all. I've never seen her get into a water dish after eating, but something about this very deep water that has, you know, opaque sides and it's nice and dark made her comfortable to go there, and it's something that I guess maybe they do in the wild. I know anacondas do this as well. Maybe it's to offset the weight after you know ingesting quite a large meal. I don't know, but it was really, really cool, and I wanted to share that with you guys. So if you haven't seen that, go check out the videos on YouTube. I do have them there. And I always return to that quote that I've mentioned several times on the podcast and unfortunately have no idea where I got it from, but the quote is essentially, the better your care, the more your animal will reward you with their fascinating natural behaviors. And that was a perfect example of that last week. So that was great. And as always, if you're looking for more information on this episode or any other episode on the Animals at Home Network, go to animalsathomenetwork.com and you can find links to every show we have and of course every episode that has been published. And if you are listening on the Apple Podcasting app, take a minute and give us a five-star rating if you're enjoying the show. You don't have to give us a five-star rating if you don't enjoy it, but I do hope you enjoy it. We have been collecting many, many five-star ratings. I don't think we've got anything else other than five-star ratings. So if you want to give us a rating, that would be great. And if you want to leave a review, that would be awesome as well. Thank you very much to our sponsor, CustomReptileHabitats.com, for sponsoring this episode of the podcast. You can find affiliate links in both the YouTube description as well as the show notes. So on to today's episode. Today I'm speaking with a guest who has been recommended and suggested several times by the listeners, and that is Francis Koskiri. Francis is a keeper out of the UK and is just an absolute wealth of information when it comes to keeping. He is essentially a reptile encyclopedia, and I think there's probably 10 or 12 episodes inside his head. We'll start with this one, but I guarantee there will be more episodes in the future. And just to give you a sense of the amount of information Francis has in his head, he actually knows the character limit on a Facebook post. Now, right now in your head, do you know how long a Facebook post can be? Probably not because you probably never hit the max. Now, Francis is actually frustrated at the fact that the character count on Facebook posts is not long enough. And I looked it up and the character count is 63,206 characters. So that's probably, I don't know, eight or 10,000 words. So these are the type of responses he'll give somebody on Facebook. And that is the amount of information he has in his head. So let's just listen to him talk. He's got just an incredible amount of information. Again, we're going to definitely do another part two in the future and probably a part three as well. I will talk to you after the episode. I hope you enjoy. Here's my conversation with Francis. All right, well, Francis, welcome to the show. Thank you for doing this. Thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure. You, uh, I, the listeners have requested you several times. You're one of the ones that names that's constantly popping up. So you've been on my list, unbeknownst to you, of a future guest to contact. So I'm definitely happy to have you on. And I know that you have a lot of experience in the hobby and lots of time in the hobby as well. So we're definitely going to pick your brain today and try to pull out some of those golden nuggets. But let's rewind the clock and and tell me about your history in the hobby. How did you get into all of this? I um, I kind of have the both the benefit and the curse of having started the hobby a different way to most people did in that I grew up in Gibraltar, which is a very, very tiny place. Uh, it's, a, it's a colony on the southern tip of Spain. And... In the 80s, there was no hobby. Uh, there were no pet reptiles you couldn't buy. You know, you couldn't, there weren't pet shops that you could walk into and buy lizards or snakes in, let alone equipment for them. So there were no vivaria. There were no like live feeder crickets or mealworms. There were no frozen mice. It was, you know, you could, you could walk in and buy a puppy if you were lucky, but not uh, reptiles in those years or, or sometimes like terrapins. So... I, from a very early age, used to just go out and catch my own reptiles, uh, you know, in the, in the early 80s. Um, I mean, the first that I ever found was a Moorish gecko in Spain. Um, it was a place called La Peñita, uh, somewhere near Andalusia. 
And I actually had no idea that you actually got sort of that many reptiles in Europe. Uh, I was under the impression that it was the same list of reptiles that you get in the UK because Gibraltar is part of, of you know, Gibraltar is British. And I had a book at that time of British reptiles. I assumed that it was the same three lizards and three snakes. So imagine my surprise when we went out one evening hunting for crickets, <laughs> um, you know, just, just to catch the big fat crickets that you used to get. And I looked on the wall and there was a, a little baby Moorish gecko there and I got extremely excited. I managed to catch it and actually get it into the box that I brought along for crickets. And of course, a gecko being a gecko just sort of zoomed straight back out of the box and I was in floods of tears. So my parents kind of reassured me, well, why were you crying? There's so many of them, you know, you, you'll, there are lots of lizards everywhere, which it was news to me. Um, so yeah, the next day they took me out and we went out onto the, the hillsides and I managed to catch a small lizard there. I, I, I mean, this was more than, you know, maybe 35 years ago. So I don't remember what it was. I imagine it was most likely a Samodromus just because I remember it being on a flat hillside. But that summer was was basically my uh, popping my reptile cherry, I suppose you could say. <laughs> you know, and from then on, I was outdoors all day, every day, you know, going out looking for snakes and frogs and terrapins and you know, lizards. And I was just bringing a, a nonstop sort of menagerie of them back myself. But of course, bringing them back was just the, you know, the first issue to overcome. Then I had to go out and find food for them. So I'd actually have to go and collect my own insects for them and catch flies and grasshoppers and crickets. Or for the snakes, I used to have to go and trap mice with the old fashioned mouse trap. So it was a different world for me back then. Um, and of course, that meant that I had to basically make it up on the fly. I had to learn by observation. Um, I wasn't, you know, obviously, there was no internet. And there were precious few books at those at that time that told me anything especially about European reptiles. Um, I mean, at that time, I don't even think the Collins Field Guide had, had come out yet. So half of the animals that I was catching, I didn't know what they actually were until much later. Um, I do remember that we ordered a book in 1987 um, on snakes at the Gibraltar bookshop. And I know the date because I've actually still got the book with the receipt in it. And it was the first ever reptile book I bought. Uh, and it was a step-by-step -step book about snakes. When it arrived, it was a little sort of leaf thin, sort of uh, soft back. And it was an okay introduction. It gave you the basics, but it was about American snakes. It wasn't about um, European snakes. So it told you everything you needed to know about bull snakes and corn snakes and black racers and boa constrictors. But it was from that that I had to extrapolate and you know try and adapt to the animals that I was keeping. So that is like, the primitive hobby really just going out catching wild caught animals and just making it up on the fly do you know what part of you wanted to keep them like what part of you wanted to capture them and then try to care for them in your own home it's a good question and i do think that there's a little of that in all of us or, or in many of us who say with this idea of going out into the world and, and hunting for your own um animal and finding it and catching it and keeping it alive. Nowadays, obviously, the world is a vastly different place. I couldn't recommend doing that. I wouldn't do it now. Um, I don't feel guilty about it, but it isn't the sort of thing that you could recommend nowadays just for people to go out as kids and collect their own animals. But back then, it was the done thing. And it was, you know, and they lived a long time. They weren't sort of dropping dead. But then again, when people talk about wild caught animals now, you're talking about wild animals that have been bought from a shop. And many of these animals, first of all, they're not European. I mean, European animals tend to be hardier uh, in general because they're adapted to the European climate. So they, they you know, because they, they deal with extremes in conditions, they've got a winter, a summer, um, they do tend to be quite hardy animals in general. Whereas if you've got a tropical day gecko or, or you know, some sort of little long-tailed skink or uh, some, you know, tropical python that comes in, it will have undergone a process. It will have been captured in its native country. It will be adapted to a specific environment. Sometimes that environment is quite stable compared to European. You know, trop the tropics don't change anywhere near as much uh, in terms of, say, uh, temperature conditions. So they'll have been caught. They'll have been held maybe for several weeks at the exporters. Then they'll have been exported and undergone that sort of stressful process. Then an importer will have got hold of them. They might have spent a few weeks or months there until a pet shop gets them. And then a pet shop will have them sort of sometimes languishing back then you know i mean you used to see things like green animals and they'd be like half dead in the in the pet shops it's, it, again it wasn't like today 
I think back then we just didn't know everything that we do now. We obviously we we did a lot of things differently, and there were species that we kept then that we don't now. We had access to, to various animals that we didn't. But a wild caught animal that's undergone all that reaches you in a different condition to a, an animal that you've gone out and caught yourself. Again, I'm I'm not uh, saying that going out and catching an animal is right or wrong. I'm I'm removing any moral judgment from it, but. If you've gone out and caught an animal, you've got it threaded from the wild, and then you can deal with it, and it's still healthy. It's as healthy as it was in the wild. Whereas an animal that's been imported might be great. Maybe that the exporter that has dealt with it and the importers are great herpetologists, and they've managed to uh, to keep it, and they've wormed it, and they've done with it really well. Uh, I mean, Tom Halverson uh, springs to mind, who was an importer in the 90s and early 2000s, from whom I got a lot of animals from. And he was marvelous. He used to cherry pick the best animals he'd only use the best exporters and used to get you could be assured of the quality of the animals that you you get but not every importer or exporter was like that sadly yeah. um and most wild caught are not like that most are yes. pretty bad when it, you know going through that whole process that you laid out that is exactly. pretty typical I, would, I don't know if i'd say most but many shall we say <laughs> many, and, yeah. it, and it depends from which region they've come for example egyptian shipments i've always found particularly easy to acclimatize even Indonesian, or many Indonesian animals, I've found quite easy. Some African and some Indonesian animals, though, not so much. Um, and again, it, it does depend on which species of animals you're dealing with and which geographical region. Um, again, because Egypt has a largely Mediterranean environment, they're quite easy animals in general to, to keep. So you don't get as many problems with them. And I think the fact that Egypt is a dry environment dry environments tend not to have as many parasites because many parasites mm. tend to rely on water and humidity to, to transfer across hosts. Whereas if Indonesia, South America, Central Africa, you have a lot more problem with internal parasites. I mean, some of the animals that we've got in, for example, Thrasops and uh, Philothamnus have been riddled and, and they've taken major work to get clean. Whereas animals from drier habitats, uh, yes, they, they still have parasites, parasites and you've got to treat them as if they still have parasites. But the fact is they're just generally not as infested as, as tropical animals tend to be. But yeah, and like you say, they, they are hardier as well. So even like through that process, without a doubt, your shipping package is going to lose humidity at some point. And if it's an animal that's already adapted for drier conditions, it's not going to come out of the box like a raisin, basically. Yeah, I mean, and that, that humidity seems to be a massive factor. Um, a good example would be boiga, uh, mangrove snakes, for example. Mm. I've had many mangrove snakes in the past, and... If you've seen the difference between a nice quality captive bred mangrove snake and a freshly imported mangrove snake wild caught, I mean that most of the ones that I received came in so severely dehydrated and emaciated that they couldn't shed for several sheds. The sheds used to come off black rather than the white sheds that they should be shedding. Um, and again, that is down to knowing how to rehydrate them, you know, putting them in a rehydration chamber for 24 to 48 hours. You know, giving them electrolyte solutions to, to rehydrate them again, you know, isotonic solutions. It's part of the process, should we say, of importing that you wouldn't have to do if you had just gone out and picked the animal up off a, off a branch. You know what I mean? And again, moral um, judgments aside, because my, my ideas and thoughts on wild court have changed over the years. Um, but again, I wouldn't be the person that I was today without going out and catching my own animals, bringing them back and trying to do the best I could with them. And, and I, I think, think that, many of us did the, exactly that. Absolutely. I mean, I, you know, even in the UK, there aren't many reptiles, but most keepers will have gone out and, you know, got frog spawn, for example, and raised the tadpoles. I mean, it's, it's a part of growing up. And I think it's a very important part that's being lost mm -hmm. nowadays, you know, or gone out and caught newts, for example. I mean, yeah, you know, I, I totally agree. I mean, I, I was catching garter snakes and, and frogs. And yeah, you keep them for a few weeks and sometimes you let them go. And exactly. So as far as, as keeping reptiles, have you always had them? Like ever since those early days when you were catching your own, have reptiles always been in your life in some in captivity always, in some form? Yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, to be honest, and there are some species of reptiles that I've always had throughout that time. Not the same species. I mean, I've outgrown, outlived, should we say, my earliest but for example, horseshoe whip snakes, since the first horseshoe whip snake I caught, again, 1987, there hasn't been a period of time in my life where I haven't had that species. So, mm -hmm. I mean, that's how, how long I've been working with that particular species. Wall lizards, Podarchus, which were, again, some of the first reptiles that I ever caught and dealt with, because obviously they're everywhere in Europe. You see them even on buildings. I've always had those, um, and 
indeed they're actually one of my favorite genera of reptile um so yes uh there hasn't been a period in my life when i've had no reptiles there have been periods when i've had fewer and there have been periods when i've had more um but you know it's, so, it's, down to how you've how i've been keeping them as well as far as career wise were you ever gravitated towards going towards something that that focuses on animals in some way absolutely yes i mean so i actually um qualified in zoology from bristol mm -hmm. university and i was fortunate enough to do voluntary work at the bristol zoo whilst i was a student and then i was invited to jersey zoo uh, which is now called the durrell zoo but i can't get used to that name uh, so <laughs> it was the jersey wildlife preservation trust headquarters at jersey zoo by my friend john far who was a, a director back then um, and has done a lot of work for the, the durrell institute uh, and i was able to actually work there for a period you know across different parts of the zoo including the Gahati reptile center and i used to got some hands-on experience there and I, I spoke to many of the great sort of keepers and sort of watched the work that they were doing there which it's incredible work i mean it wouldn't be remiss me to say they're probably the most important conservation center in the world mm -hmm. uh, for conservation at least back then I, maybe they're eclipsed now i don't know but at the time they were just doing groundbreaking work um with species that were so rare that other zoos just didn't have access to them. Um, I mean, not just reptiles. I mean, I remember there were partula snails, mm. um, which I may have dropped one. <laughs> <laughs> they don't like that, I'm sure. We won't mention that. <laughs> uh, I mean, you know, even back when Jamaican boas were one of the most mm. endangered snakes in the world. I mean, nowadays in the hobby, they're everywhere. They're quite, well, not everywhere, but they're quite common snakes. That's largely because of the breeding projects that that zoo and other zoos, such as London Zoo, have done with that species. But back then, Jamaican boas were almost extinct in the wild and they were extremely rare. I mean, we're talking 1996, 1997. And oddly enough, I mean, I'm sure we'll get into reptile enrichment later on, but one of the first enrichment studies run on snakes was at Bristol Zoo with Jamaican boas. Except that rather than from a husbandry perspective, the reason was is that it was worried because they were possibly going to be reintroducing them. Um, mm. They were worried whether or not the the different experience that the snakes had in either a minimalist or enriched enclosure would affect how well they adapt to the native environment. So actually, even back then, that was when um, some of the first studies on, on the effects of enrichment on snakes and their behavior was being done. And then after that, I, <laughs> I kind of sold out a little bit because I had always wanted to work with reptiles, but I very quickly came to understand we say that I also like money. <laughs> well, I like, you know, I like having reptiles and being able to look after my own. And I like going out to eat. I like holidays. And where I live, let, let's just say there weren't very many opportunities that would have sort of pandered to my desire to work with animals. So I had to make a choice early on. Did I want to continue sort of following that route and not earning as much, shall we say, just bluntly, um, but also working with animals, or did I want to do a more mundane job and have the money to go on several holidays a year and keep lots of, you know, hundreds of animals? And, I, you know, I sometimes regret it, but I, I did sort of sell out and I now just work a completely non-animal related job. Um, in fact, I've, I've done several, but I'm also able to keep the collection that I do because of it and travel to see them in the wild. So it's it's a it's, it's a, a trade-off. Yeah, and I think so many people think like they, oh, I, oh, I love animals. I have a passion for animals, so I must go into a career. And I think there's so many people, and I'm the same way, really, that just I have a different job that's not related to, to animals at all. And it allows me to care for an, and keep animals more than I'd probably be able to keep on a, on a zoo salary or something, you know? So, I mean, you're trading off having working with those amazing zoo animals or, or doing research if you've gone into a research sort of role. But you wouldn't necessarily have the life that, that you otherwise might, you know. Um, yeah, exactly. It's a trade-off. I mean, everyone makes different life choices, shall we, shall we say. I mean, uh, I, I do sometimes wonder what could have happened, but I know that I wouldn't have done the things I've done or kept the species I've kept or the salary of, say, a zookeeper or a researcher, at least at the beginning. Obviously, after a few years, that might have changed, but I'm impatient. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, I hear you. And as far as your your collection goes, as you said, it's kind of oscillated over the years. How many do you know, do you have a number of how many animals you have right now? I don't know the exact number, but it's somewhere in between 170 and 180. Um, but that is a massive collection. For a private I keeper. actually used to have more. I mean, I used to have over 300 at one point up until about 10 years ago. 
but then I used to keep more in the rack and stack and style of enclosures or I, I was never fully a rat keeper, but I used to have many snakes in tubs and rats. And nowadays I have none that obviously it is a large number, but you've got to remember that I have self-imposed restrictions on how I keep them. Every snake I keep must be an enclosure as long as it is that that's, I mean, it's, it's, it's as much to limit the numbers that I keep as, as much as anything else. Mm -hmm. And every lizard I keep must be an enclosure five times as long as it is as a minimum. I mean, often these are, the enclosures are often bigger than this, but it means that it sounds like a lot of animals, but they're very small animals. So most of the snakes I keep are three or four feet long. Most of the lizards are six inches long. I, I don't keep lizards more than the size of a Western green lizard. Most are much smaller. So it does enable me to keep more animals. Um, I'm also lucky in that half my collection is at my old house, at my mum's house. So it's, it is proving to be a difficult thing to, to work with with the lockdown you know, moving backwards and forwards between collections, but I've got three rooms now with animals in. As I'm sure you can see behind, I've got some in my lounge and then I've got a central room where I quarantine stuff. Um, and then you have a whole other room in a different house. A big room, yes. <laughs> with, with that mainly has all my larger, older animals that I've been keeping for longest with my established collection. So there I've got my Philodrys, Baroni, Boigers, Flying Snakes, a lot of the Whip Snakes, most of my Samophids, um, the older Rat Snakes, which some of which I've had since... The 90s you know they're, they're all very old animals now um i also keep uh, many whip snakes so whip snakes are my uh one of my favorite groups some ophids so sand snakes and uh beak snakes and so on i've got seven species of sand snake um many tree snakes thrasops uh which uh, is my moniker on online um coach whips and most of the european um and asian rat snakes but it's a pretty eclectic collection and also lots of lacerted lizards, which are my favorite group of reptiles. So as far as how, how are you managing this? Like, are, are you, is there someone that's helping you do any of this or is this a hundred percent you and then you're bouncing back between homes? It's a hundred percent me. Well, I can't say it's a hundred percent me. My mother cleans and waters many of the animals. There are some that she won't open. So for example, diadem snakes, which hiss as soon as coming in, she won't go near those. So she won't open those because she knows that they are very aggressive. So I, needs to sort of be there at several times a week to clean and water them it it used to be easier as my workplace was literally next to my house so i could just sort of bounce back and forth even at lunchtime and, and work on them then um, but my workplace moved somewhat just down the road but it's still a little bit further and of course the lockdown this year has made things a bit more complicated shall we say so it has been a, a bit wearing and tiring um because obviously i still need to go into the house but my mother is is over 60 now so I don't want to sort of endanger her by having too much contact with her. So I tend to do it when she is out at work. Um, so but yeah, it's a I mean, giant it, game it, of Tetris with your schedule. Yeah, the logistical issues have been <laughs> great, shall we say. So it, yeah, it has I, been uh, pushing me a bit to the bone. Um, I imagine. So tell me a little bit about how your care has progressed. Because you were saying, you know, obviously we we're talking about how you started. And then you, there was a phase when you had more animals and rack systems. And so tell me about how you got into that and then how you phased out of it. Well, I mean, ironically, I actually started off better. Um, mm -hmm. So when I was catching them, one of the good things about finding these things in the wild and seeing them is that obviously when you're going out to look for them, you find out what they're doing at what time, you see the habitats they're in, what they're doing. So where, for example, snakes, when people say snakes don't bask or they, they only live under stone, it's like, well, they don't. I, I find them, you know, on paths or on trees, you know. Um, so you, you get the idea of what they're doing and when. Um, and over the years, you build up a knowledge of, of where they might be at any particular season. You know, they'll be in different places in the cooler seasons to the um, on it, even in spring compared to where they are in summer at different times of day. So I used to go out and quite often bring back small plants and cuttings. And again, nowadays, I don't recommend this being done. We're talking about a 12 year old boy here. So, it, you know, <laughs> I, I, you, you can't ascribe any moral judgment to this because I didn't know any better then. Um, and obviously you didn't have the issues with. Um, you know, transmission of pathogens and so on at, at, that you do today. But back then, as an innocent kid, I used to just go out and I'd bring plants, I'd bring stones, I'd even bring substrate in bags from where I found them. And I'd try and replicate the habitat. Now, I know you've had Joe Brabin and Harvey Tweets and Liam Sinclair on the show, and they, they've done marvelously in explaining how the advances in heat and light have, have come on. Obviously, back then, we didn't have that. We had household bulbs. Um, mm -hmm. And I've always sort of done best with household bulbs. You know, 
I've never really liked CHEs. I've never liked heat mats except a supplementary heat. But I've always seemed to get my best success with, with household bulbs. So back then, you'd have vivs, which were sometimes just hollowed out television sets. So the televisions then were literally just like wooden panels, you know, yeah. great big boxes. And you could, the old ones, you could actually just hollow them out and make a viv out of those um, or build them out of melanin. And with those retrofitted vivs, you'd I'd just put a household light bulb in and it would work really well for some reason. There was no uh, UV until... I, I didn't really get hands on UV until the mid '90s, say, uh, which were Growlux bulbs. They were they were plant bulbs, not reptile bulbs. I think Zoomed started bringing out bringing out the Vita light around then as well. Um, but no, back then it was simply a household light bulb in a wooden box, or I'd have them on my sun terrace in. Um, so we used to have great big plastic bins that used to be full of seawater because in Gibraltar you have taps which um, which pump water directly from the sea, and a lot of fishermen there have the taps flowing non-stop and they keep live bait. But I used to use those great big vats for keeping animals in, you know, and they'd benefit from sun exposure and it was their own habitat. When we came over, it was kind of like Christmas for me because you've, you've gone from a place where you're finding, shall we say, the dull brown animals in the world, although, of course, many of them were very beautiful. You come to the pet shop here and, and in the mid-90s, you've got all the different types of king snakes, you know, maybe... 16, 17 subspecies and species of king snake and milk snake, all these rat snakes, even corn snakes were amazing creatures to me, just really brightly colored. So obviously I, I kind of had it in my head that I wanted one of every color. Um, and again, it was a, a juvenile idea, but I can't deny that a lot of people seem to follow that kind of mindset, shall we say. Um, and this was the era of really useful boxes which are the uk tubs hadn't sort of appeared yet so there was a kind of box which i think was american called a contico box which actually used to be a, a large flat tub which was it was wider than most really useful boxes it had sort of vents in on the side and i used to use a lot of those um they were not escape proof as well they were quite soft plastic <laughs> so like a, a strong snake could actually sort of squeeze its way out of if you didn't have them sort of in a in an alcove exactly the right sort of dimensions to slot them in which i didn't um <laughs> so i kind of got praise of this idea of just owning lots of animals um and i did that for many years i did that i mean even until 2008 there are still if you if you look deep enough online on the reptile forums in the uk you can see me talking about rubs quite you know with, with you know with quite reverently and how good that they are um and it's one of the half truths of of snake keeping you can keep the animals in them they'll live they'll breed some of them might even thrive, depending on the species. But I found out very quickly that I wasn't enjoying the keeping. For me, it was the same as having, I mean, another sort of horrible thing that I used to do um, when I was young. Well, my father used to do it more, but he sort of got me into it, was butterfly catching, which I very quickly got grew out of. I didn't like it, this idea of pinning live insects and, you know, uh, poisoning them and, and having them on display. But to me, having a bunch of tubs was the same as having a bunch of pinned butterflies that you'd sort of draw out, look at it for five minutes and then close it. And that was it. It wasn't keeping for me. I enjoyed keeping because I like watching the animals, seeing what they do, how they move, their behavior. Owning something is not the same as caring for it, shall we say. I'm sure that there are many snake keepers sort of screaming at the screen at the moment. But for me, this, this is my personal uh, outlook. And my mindset was that there was no point in having so many animals and breaking my back, scrubbing out all these tubs. Because some say that tubs, keeping tubs is easier. I'm sure if you've got one tub, yeah, you can empty it out, clean it, put it back. But when you've got hundreds of tubs, it's back-breaking work cleaning it. And you've got to clean them a lot more often than you do a viv with substrate and, and so on. Um, so I very, I'll say very quickly, it, over a period of 10 or 15 years, it sort of percolated in on my mind that, I wasn't really enjoying this anymore. I was enjoying the animals I was still keeping in vivs, but I wasn't enjoying keeping the animals in tubs that I couldn't see. Yes, part of it was aesthetics. Part of it was that I just simply couldn't see the animals. But especially with lizards, obviously I wasn't keeping lizards with tubs. I mean, this is a separate um, thought, but I was finding that lizards I was keeping, I didn't enjoy the, the, the diurnal lizards as much because back then we didn't have the same UV technology. Growing up, looking at wild war lizards and eyed lizards you see that there's a certain way they move there's a certain way they sort of iridesce in the sun that you don't get under a certain type of light in captivity they, they weren't as active and 
I kind of got to the point where I stopped keeping Lacertives uh, indoors for a long time. I just wouldn't until lighting technology caught up, which it didn't until maybe the 2010s or so. Um, so those were the two things that were affecting how I was keeping. One was I wasn't enjoying keeping things in tubs anymore. I mean, I was breeding king snakes by the, you know, by the hundred and rat snakes and all kinds of other snakes. But I just wasn't enjoying them as much as my sort of my dull brown whip snakes, which I still had in nicely set up vivs because I'd seen how active they are in the wild. So I kind of, I was keeping them that way. Whereas a king snake, which I've never seen in the wild, I was treating as a commodity rather than an animal. Um, and I think for me personally, seeing an animal in the wild really affects how I keep it. Um, nowadays, obviously, it's much easier to do research. You can speak to people online. You can look on iNaturalist and Herping the Globe and Hurt Mapper. You can search for scientific papers. You can find everything that you want about the ecology of a particular animal, uh, everything that's ever been published in some cases. And it's easier to have that information at your fingertips. But back then, it wasn't so hard. You had books, which were expensive, so you had to build up the collection over time. And you had other keepers, which you would have to phone or write letters to. <laughs> you, know, it was, there were the, you know, up until email sort of became a thing. Um, that's how we do it, is literally just phone people and talk to them or um, attend shows. Or I mean, I remember John Farr, who was the, the gentleman that uh, I told you worked at Jersey Zoo. He used to send me a package every month with all of the the new scientific papers that Jersey used to produce. Mm -hmm. And I used to love that day. It was a great big, uh, thick brown envelope addressed to Animal Boy. And um, <laughs> it was, it'd have all of the new research material, all the magazines from Jersey Zoo. And I, was, I used to just read all that and eat it up. I mean, it wasn't all about reptiles. It was, you know, there's loads about um, the mammals and birds as well. But he knew I had a bent for reptiles. So he, he used to send me as much reptile-related stuff as possible. So... I digressed a lot. I apologize. <laughs> we were talking about the way I keep. Um, so and that's what this is for. Digress as much as you yeah, want. Um, it got to the point where I had been having thoughts about how I was keeping and the way I enjoyed keeping it and what I was keeping, because you've got to realize as well that not every animal that you keep hits the same spot. Sometimes it takes a while to realize what type of animal you'd like to keep. I mean, I, I find all snakes, amazing, beautiful creatures, but having kept them, as an example, I'm not as interested in, say, royal pythons or blood pythons as I am as I am in a, a coach whip or a whip snake mm -hmm. or a, a green lizard. It's, it's you know, the different animals appeal to different people. That's not to say that they're any better or worse. I still love the animals. I think they're beautiful creatures. But I want a certain thing when I keep an animal. I want something that I can watch and see. And I tend to gravitate very much towards animals I've seen in the wild as well, uh, which is why most of my collection is North African, uh, European central asian um you know so africa I've, I've traveled much of africa starting to to make sort of headway in asia now recently as well europe i've seen much of europe so i tend to focus on that kind of animal um well and it, it does I, this sort of a sentiment that i've heard keepers talk about a lot before is you know they have a bunch of a rack system and eventually that transitions to feeling less like a hobby and more like work and then they sort exactly. of pull themselves back because it's exactly like you're saying it they're not enjoying it anymore and then there is that is sort of if if you see an animal out in the wild, you have that image of what it's like, what what its wild potential is like. And if you come home to your collection and you're not seeing that from your animal, the only thing you're left with is I'm not providing it with something. There's some something um, missing, right? So I mean, I mean, for example, if you're walking around, say, southern Spain or Gibraltar, and you you're walking across a dilapidated rock wall with holes in it, and you look on that wall, and suddenly there's a horseshoe whip snake climbing up that wall. I think, oh, that's interesting. And then the next day you might see one crossing a road at night. And the next day you might see one in a house. I mean, they used to literally come into the houses sometimes. And I've seen them actually climbing the, the side of a mortared house. So it, it's, you know, not even the brickwork is is visible. It's, you know, the, the Mediterranean style houses have got like white. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Wood. And I've actually seen them climbing that up. Wow. Now, horseshoe whip snakes are terrestrial snakes. They're, they're labeled terrestrial. They tend to live in lowlands. But in Gibraltar and in mountainous areas they're not they, they climb walls they become saxicolous they, they live on rock walls and they're one of the european snakes that eats bats um in fact they've been look you know recorded eating five different types of bats now it's a regular thing it's the only european snake that regularly has been documented eating various types of bats 
to get the bats, they're climbing up these walls and going into the holes to get to the uh, the crevices where the bats live. Obviously, escalating snakes also eat bats. Um, somebody posted a picture of a, of a Malpolon, a Montpellier snake, with a bat, but that was like one of the first times it had been documented. But horseshoe whip snakes with them, Chiroptera phagi, bat eating, is a regular thing. They'll eat birds. I mean, I remember vividly catching a really big one in my childhood, which had a huge bulge in it, and later that day it regurgitated it, and it was an adult blackbird. Um, wow. They'll eat other snakes. I mean, they'll, they'll eat vipers, you know, venomous snakes. They'll they'll take readily um, great big lizards. I mean, they're, they're, they'll eat all kinds of things. If you're just feeding it lab mice, are you catering to that? Are you catering to this? If you've got it in a tub where it can't climb, where it can't expose itself to the ridiculous UV indices that I've recorded them under. I mean, I've recorded them under UV index seven to nine. I mean, it's really high Mediterranean sun at midday, and you sometimes see them on walls just just soaking it in. Obviously, they won't be doing that all the time. That's you know the dangerous thing is if you expose them to that all the time. Of course, it might be detrimental, but they do it part of the time. Mm-hmm. So if you've got it in a small dark tub with no light, no nothing to climb no variety of food can you be said to be keeping it and allowing it to express its behaviors i'd argue not Mm -hmm. so others might you know others might not but for me that's a big part of keeping um it's learning about what the animals do what they eat um yeah well and and it makes total sense and and that's the thing it's funny with colubrids because when i first got into the hobby for some reason colubrids i was just not interested in like i just had no interest in them but over the last year or so especially with a collection like yours i've just become obsessed with rat snakes especially and it's something that i eventually want to add to my collection there's like a a dynamism about these snakes they're they're, they move quickly and they're they're very attentive which is very different than like you were saying with a a royal python or a ball python there's a little bit less active and they're a little more methodical with their with their movement but when you have a colubrid that's just this lightning quick animal it feels so wrong to put it in a tub and i I also would not want to put a ball python in a tub either but colubrid is on another level yeah i mean it's a different thing ball pythons or royal pythons i prefer to call them but it's bad enough having them in tubs. I don't approve of it. I don't agree with it. I've written a lot on how I, on, on the scientific evidence for the fact that that shouldn't be right. And I've seen wild bull pythons. They bask. I mean, there's, there's mm-hmm. no, you can't argue with me that they don't because I've seen it. All right. Um, and I've spoken to Luca Luiselli, who possibly has done more field research on them than any living man. And he tells me that they climb. Mm-hmm. You can't argue with that kind of data. Um, and it's not just in one localized area. Some would have you believe it's, it's across their range. Yeah. But I get it. I mean, if, if they're slow animals, they're, they're methodical, as you say, it's a different thing seeing one of those in a tub than it is seeing, say, a Russian rat snake or, or an American rat snake or, a, you know, any, any kind of active snake that you know will just won't stop moving and climbing and might have a huge range that it will go over day. I mean, even now, I look at, at, at the vids I've got. I mean, and I have to say, the vids I've got I, are at least as long as the snake is. But for example, I've got beauty snakes, beautiful six long, six foot long snakes, sometimes more. And I've seen them out in China, and they've, I've seen them twenty five to thirty feet up a cliff climbing. I've seen them on the Great Wall, the actual Great Wall of China. I've seen beauty snakes climbing along that. It's like even a viv that's as long as they are seems small by comparison. So I mean, I, I would ideally have like the whole side of a room say obviously when you have a large collection there's a trade-off between how much you can offer the snake and how many snakes you can keep you know i used to think well i've got lots of snakes but they've met this sort of minimum standard which is more than average so i say but even now i sometimes think well i could give them even more you know and, and that's with every animal kept with uv with what I would say is correct heating or the tub eating that is most, uh, that replicates the wild the most, the size of the vids are, are quite large. And even then I look at them and I think, you know, what, I could do more. Um, so there's always progression to be made. There's always an improvement. Yeah. yeah and I have those moments as well. It's like you, you'll see your snake kind of curled up in a ball sleeping and the enclosure seems fine. And then you see it roaming around and you go, oh, this thing is too small. Like I can go bigger. It's, it's always a bit of a trick on your mind when you see it curled up in the hide. You think, oh, there's plenty of space. But as soon as they start using it, you go, OK, maybe I need to offer more. Of course, that, you know, like you say, it's a trade off as well. And I even know, like I've seen pictures and I can see kind of behind you, you have your 
enclosures are full of enrichment and, and wood. And so, what else are you doing? We kind of talked about the lighting and the length, but as far as decor and whatnot goes, what do you mainly you usually do when you're setting um, up an enclosure? They're fairly basic. To be honest, most of them are fairly basic. I, I, I do have most tropical species with live plants, for example. So, I mean, I've never been a follower of this bioactive craze. And, and I watched the roundtable that you did with again with Liam and Joseph and Harvey. And it was great. And it, it echoed many of the thoughts I've had as well. Bioactive is a great method of keeping. It can be. Mm-hmm. I don't think that it suits every species or every habitat, at, at least in the confines of a small terrarium. It just doesn't. Um, for example, yeah. coach whips. I keep coach whips, uh, and, and this is on the advice of several herpers, including Mike Clarkson, that have gone out and measured surface temperatures that these animals are basking at. And there are several uh, papers, for example, by Gary Ferguson, showing their UV indices, their preferred temperature. They exist at ridiculous uh, at surface temperatures. I mean, the, the sort of surface temperatures that you provide in a garment or a monitor lizard. Wow. You know, they've been recorded at 70 degrees Celsius rock temperatures. Oh, my God. Degrees. Obviously, the, the enclosure can't be that big, or you'd have a cooked snake. But the surface temperature, for it to get that hot at the basking spot, in an enclosed viv, it would increase transpiration of the plants just a ridiculous amount. It, it would be very difficult to keep live plants in a wooden viv with that kind of temperature. If it was glass, it could, but I mean, and, and I do think glass is a, a very good um, material to make vivs from. Uh, a lot of people disagree, but the fact that it loses heat actually is a benefit, not a hindrance, because you can have an amazingly hot basking spot on one end and the other end can be room temperature. And that's yeah, great. True. That's what you want. You want a gradient. Uh, but again, I digress. Um, so things like frogs, small lizards, flying snakes, I have in, on bioactive-ish setups. I've, I've never been all that big on all the soil organisms and custodians and leaving skins and re, you know refuse food in there. I don't do that. I, I clean every day. Um, everything else, the substrates I prefer are soil-based substrates. So soil, sand, cocoa coir, grit, fine orchid bark, mixed in various ways. I have some on Aspen as well, and Aspen works perfectly well. I, I've got no problem with Aspen or Orbios or any of those other bedding. As long as the substrate's loose and the animal can burrow into it, that's enriching. I mean, a, a snake, you could have a bare viv, and, and I used to have one of my bull snakes in an almost bare viv as an experiment, with a six-inch layer of soil and then a, a big layer of desiccated pine needles. And it was fine. It was great because it could use that as hiding spot. Right. You'd see it sort of burrow down into the pine needles and come out elsewhere, Bull snakes are hardy species. Maybe that wouldn't work for every species, but for, for a bull snake or a coach whip, it would what be What was the experiment? What were you looking for when you were testing that out, just out of curiosity? I was just looking to see whether or not it would sort of um, curl up and get stressed, as I was told it would, or if, you know, it could live just fine, and how much it would dig. Um, and that's another thing you used to see. I mean, there have been lots of videos shared. I think uh, Ashley Dezan shared one in AHH um, a few days ago of a moiler snake digging. And I used to see that a lot. So you'd see the animals digging with their their heads and you'd see them sort of hooking mm. huge amounts of substrate and i was just curious whether or not what it would do and also it looked like the habitats that i've seen them found in. so i mean if some of these really cool herping videos like nhk herping you see them find snakes just on grassland um, you know obviously there are boards but there's not much else there so if i kept california king snakes again for example i'll try and replicate that i'd have a flat mm. board under a halogen and then not much else, maybe a few branches, but a fairly open viv. And again, coach whips, they need open space as well. Um, other than that, um, the, the things that I have in every viv, um, UV light of the correct uh, index. Um, and that that's the difficult thing because without a, a UV meter, you've got to go by the manufacturer's instructions. The problem there is that UV drops off over time. Mm-hmm. So... And this is why I really recommend a solar meter when you've got lots of animals all with UV, but some animals have got lower UV requirements. I mean, I wouldn't give a leopard gecko as much UV as I give a, a wall lizard. But once you see that the bulbs start deteriorating, you can still use them. You cycle them down to the geckos and you can exactly use them for months sometimes later on. It saves you ridiculous amounts of money. I mean, I, I would say that the, that solar meter for £225 must have saved me Ten thousand pounds easily over the last oh my few God. years, because if you've got ninety bulbs, I mean, it's like, and all of them need to be changed every couple of years. I mean, I'm, you know, individually they're what fifteen pounds each, but when you've that's got really a hundred of them. That's a that's a lot of bulbs that needs to be changed. So, anything that saves money on that helps. 
Uh, yeah, even if you get 14 months out of a 12 month bulb, exactly. that overtime adds and, up. And some of them, I mean, I've got some that are more than two years old and they're still giving out usable UV. Uh, wow. Especially the Arcadia bulbs are very good for that. Uh, mm. you know, the, the T5s, the T8s tend to deteriorate a bit quicker, but they're also a lot cheaper. So, yeah, exactly. Um, so, UV um, and how I uh, apply that has changed as well over the years. Obviously, as technology has increased, as we've got the T5s, they've replaced the T8s. I remember I used to use two bulbs for the UV. I used to use um, Hagen Life Glow or Life Glow 2. I used to buy out like the entire UK stock sometimes <laughs> just from all the online shops. I'd just buy them. Um, and that would give out UV. But the, the problem with that is that the light it used to give was sometimes quite a sickly sort of purplish or bluish. Mm -hmm. um, sorry, no, that, that, that was the, the full spectrum. So that was the white light. And then the RectiGlow 10s used to give out the purplish light. So I'd have to have two, one to give out more bright light and want to give out more uv because especially in lizards obviously um many lacertids and iguanas as you know they've got pineal eyes that will detect light intensity that basically gets them to bask it stimulates basking behavior so even if you've got uv they might not necessarily bask under it because they they don't recognize it as an opportunity to bask without the bright right. light mm -hmm. um with snakes I used to provide less light. So lizards, I used to have banks of UVs, sometimes as many as four for lacertids. Uh, so four lights, so two UV lights, a 6%, a 12%, and two Arcadia Pros, and then the heater. With snakes, it was usually the heater, and it started off as one UV light, but now I use two because, again, I like to have a decent amount of light intensity. Sometimes I'll use the Kinfire uh, LED bulbs for that, or sometimes the Arcadia uh, Jungle Dawns, they're very mm -hmm. good as well. Um, so there's a balance. So you're looking for heating, light, you know, full spectrum lighting and UV. Again, some people may, may not want to provide all of that, but for me, that's what, that's the, for me, that's the gold standard. It's, it's you're trying to replicate the sun. Yeah. Um, and to do that, you need more than one bulb. You can't do it with one bulb. As we stand. <laughs> exactly. Um, obviously the heating, I mean, I, I mentioned, and I, I, I took care to mention these household bulbs that I used to use that stood me in very good stead. It wasn't until the last few years that I spoke to Roman Murin that I realized why I was having such success with them. The reason is because they're inefficient bulbs. They, they actually let out a lot of infrared A, near infrared, which yep. it's just a more beneficial, stimulating type of heat. Um, so not only does that type of heat penetrate the flesh of the animals more deeply than the kind of heat given out by, say, uh, a ceramic, that type of heat stimulates mitochondria in the cells to um, to produce ATP, adenosine triphosphate, which is like an en it's an energy currency for the body. And and, and Roman has, has said, I mean, they use that even in um, rehabilitation of wounds. They'll they use that yeah. kind of heat to, to make that. That's the kind of heat that forms the bulk of the heat of sunlight. It's the reason that sunlight feels so nice. It's a massive difference. I mean, and, and you can actually see the animal's behavior change under it. I can attest to that because I've tried pretty much every kind of bulb that you can. They they do behave differently under that bulb. You'll see the basking uh, behavior stimulated. You'll see them flatten out beneath those bulbs, you know, stretching those cervical ribs and flattening themselves as you do in the wild. So it's uh, it's interesting to see that. The other thing I always provide is a humid hide now. Um, mm -hmm. I think humidity is often overlooked, especially with arid animals but even in a desert or in an arid area like mediterranean these animals will find um, places where water collects this was driven home to me a few times when i've been looking for lizards on walls and i found cracks in a wall around a tap with the tap sort of leaking and i found like a hundred lizards all squeezed into those tap just in that crack i'm like wow how many are in there <laughs> and of course they've gathered around the water feature so now what I used to do, I mean, it was commonplace for tropical animals, like some of the rarer rat snakes, like the bamboo rats and mandarins, was to provide a small box full of milled sphagnum moss and loam or, you know, damp substrate and with an entrance hole. I do that for all animals now. If I don't do that, I'll have a, a curved piece of cork bark buried in the substrate. And beneath that, I'll have the sphagnum and I'll lift that up and spray it every day or every few days as it dries out. And if you do that, you will never experience a bad shed. It just, it won't happen. If they've got access to that kind of humidity, you won't get bad sheds. Yeah, so, there's, that's one of the issues with the, the care guides giving us those macro environments rather than the micro environments that these animals oh, yeah. are just amazing at finding, right? Yeah, I mean, care guides are, 
I'm not keen on them. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, this idea of the care sheets, it's, it's what I call by the numbers keeping. And yeah. I don't like it. So you look at a snake, oh, this snake needs 30 degrees, this snake needs 28 degrees. It, it's, it's rubbish. Um, snakes don't, I mean, with the exception of some tropical thermoconforming snakes that can't really make much change because temperatures are so constant, most snakes, and, and certainly most snakes in the hobby, most reptiles, not snakes, they don't live at one preferred temperature. Uh, and, yeah. and actually, I actually did research on this on the Andalusian war lizards in my youth. Um, it was one of my research products was um, the preferred temperature of, of these lizards varies. It varies with age. It varies at different parts of the year. It varies before and after they've eaten. So postprandial and prepandial, it'll vary. It varies by gender. So males or females will, will have different preferences. It varies whether or not the female is gravid or pregnant or not. You can't sort of pander to that with just one temperature. It just cannot happen. Mm-hmm. So this is why thermal gradients are so important. And it's not just a, a, a small gradient of five degrees. You need wide gradients of many of these species from room temperature up to 40 degrees surface temperature or more. I mean, people ask about brumation, and I'm sure we'll talk about brumation soon because it's that time of year. Um, mm-hmm. The problem with brumation and finding animals in the world, room temperature, I mean, in this room, it's 22 degrees. Um, that's that's not winter temperature. That's not no. even, that's warmer than night temperature in many of the places where these animals find. If you go out to the desert in Egypt, it's more than, it's, it's far colder than 22 degrees. Um, and I'd, I'd assume it's the same if you go out in the deserts anywhere else, like in, in North America, it gets colder than that. Oh, so yeah. a room temperature of 18 to 22 degrees, it's a confusing thing. So I don't use night heat for almost all my animals. Mm-hmm. Um, tropical animals are different. For those, you can you they may need background heat. I've been out in the jungles of southern China. It's like 35 degrees and you've, you're sweating bullets. That's different. But the temperate animals that form most of the species that are commonly kept um night temperatures don't get that high often um so a big uh, variance in in temperature is important i feel and especially a, a nightly drop mm-hmm. some animals uh, for example thrasops i've got thrasops next to me they're montane species so they'll live in the tropics but they're at high altitude and they need to drop below 18 degrees at night because it gets cold in those mountain cloud forests yeah what I found and what others found, I'm sure Skip Loader, who, who also has kept many of these, has found, is that they might, they like warmth during the day, but at night, if you fed them and you don't lower the temperature, they'll regurgitate their food. Really? Yeah. And I just couldn't figure out for months why this was happening until it started dropping the temperatures. Didn't happen anymore. So that's just one of those little species specific things where Thrasops Jackson and I. I found that my animals regurgitated if they were kept at night over a certain amount. So I used to have them at, put them at room temperature. Do you have um, any idea why, why that would be? I don't. <laughs> it's, weird. Just, uh, it's a weird sort of physiological thing. I, I don't know whether or not it's to do with their habitat or the particular animals I've got. I mean, the animals, the, the Jackson I have got are um, captive bred. I had some wild caught, which didn't last as long, but they were exactly the same. Interesting. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, that's just one of those weird things that you find out through trial and error i suppose um well and so, it's true there's so so many of these animals even lots of the australian pythons too they have some dips in in the winter or well, even in in the night in, and in the winter both in, in sort of both combinations that get way colder than you know the 78 that people say to keep them at well i mean leopard geckos people mm-hmm. assume leopard geckos i mean i could talk a whole program just on bloody leopard geckos <laughs> but I, I hope not to as I, I spend too much time talking about them as it is but yeah, they can exist in desert areas, but they also exist in in cold mountain forests, and they exist in they found them in Nepal at high altitudes, at far cooler temperatures than than we're giving them. Um, mm. So, you know, a, a lot of uh, what we know about these animals is, shall we say, extrapolated incorrectly? Shall we say, or, or there's yeah. half truths involved that don't tally up with how we what we observe in the wild now i'm not going to say that everything in the wild is better you know i'm not one of these people that say oh it's better off in the world they're not captive animals tend to live longer they don't have the problems of predation or yeah. parasitism they don't have to deal with being beaten with a stick by any passing human which happens an awful lot mm-hmm. they don't have to deal with habitat destruction pollution getting run over by cars 
captivity isn't a bad thing on an individual level. We could, you know, we could debate all night whether or not the captive traders had a, an influence on them on a species level. But for an individual, if you're keeping them well, actually, I don't think captivity is such a bad thing. Yeah. If you're keeping them well, that's the uh, the kicker. Well, but, and I think that's one of the things with the tub keeping is is probably the most pernicious. Is it removes you so much from the wild. Yeah. You're you're not interacting with that animal. You're not looking at it as an animal that has, should should be in this sort of section of the world. You're just looking at it as a drawer, and you're not thinking about all those things that you you really should be. Well, I mean, and again, there have been studies across all sorts of taxa showing the differences between that style of keeping and keeping them in which, and some of the actual the differences in behavior and cognition that are being found are, are, are remarkable. I, I honestly don't understand how somebody can look at these studies and say, you know what, it's all the same. It's not all the same. Mm-hmm. You're literally having studies where snakes are being found to habituate more quickly to new environments, to show less stress, to take food more quickly and adapt to different types of food more quickly, to learn things like mazes and remember far more quickly than those that are kept in a, in a simple enclosure. I'm not going to say just tubs. A vivarium could be badly set, set, set out as well. It's not a tub versus viv thing. If you look at Hilary Haring on AHA, she's got marvelous tub setups. They're planted. They've got the correct lighting over them. They're fantastic. Yeah. Do most tub keepers do that? No. But that isn't to say that you can't do it. It's just that most tub keepers use tubs for a specific reason, which is ease of care and cramming as many animals into a certain space in order to maximize profits, usually. They've got their reasons for doing it, but those reasons don't align necessarily with better welfare for the animals. Exactly. And so as far as, because this is always the debate, right, where you have these people who are large industrial breeders who are breeding thousands of animals. And I think if anyone had an argument, you know, to use a rack system, it would be them. They have biosecurity and whatnot. And I actually don't really like talking about that group of people very much because I'm not going to influence the, you know, the Brian Barcheks of the world. But there are people who are doing smaller projects and smaller breeding projects or just keepers. It, and I think people think, if I want to breed snakes, I have to use a rack. It's the only way to do it. And which is, I think, a, a fallacy. And you actually, I assume, have breeding projects going on and you're not using racks. So maybe you could talk a little bit about that. Well, I'm a keeper. I'm a pet keeper. I'm not a breeder. I don't like the word breeder. Mm-hmm. I'm a pet keeper, but I have, I have multiple animals, so they breed. It happens. I mean, um, the, the fallacy is that breeding reptiles is a difficult thing to do. Most species are not difficult to breed. I mean, again, mm-hmm. you're going to have lots of viewers shouting and screaming, but I'm sorry, most reptiles are easy to breed. If you have a well-conditioned male and a well-conditioned female and you put them together, with the exception of the odd species with, with weird um, needs or that comes from a habitat that we haven't understood yet or it, it's particularly difficult to breed, for example, savannah monitors come to mind. Most reptiles, if you put them together sooner or later, they breed. It just happens. I mean, I used to do it when I was nine years old. I've got a cousin <laughs> that breeds you know, snakes at, that was breeding snakes at 11. It's not a difficult thing, and even kids can do it. So that's that's the first thing. Is like just because you're doing it in a larger quantity doesn't make you a better keeper. Mm-hmm. And again, I'm sure there are people throwing the, the things at the, at the camera at the moment, but I'm sorry, that's just it. it. It's not difficult to breed most reptiles. With some, there are obviously there are some that are lesser known that have difficulties. But if we're talking about most of the stuff that are kept commonly, your bull snakes, your king snakes, your royal pythons, your boa constrictors, your bearded dragons, leopard geckos, crested geckos, all of, most of the species that are industrially bred, as you put it. They're not difficult to breed, I'm sorry. Um, there, there's nothing sort of magical to it. You know, it, it's not uh, a difficult thing. So when people tell me, oh, you can't breed them outside traps, I say nonsense. I've been doing it for 30 odd years. <laughs> like I know many other people that have been doing it for, for twice that long that have never used tubs. You know, uh, don't don't think that I'm anything special. I'm not. I'm just a pet keeper. I happen to keep a lot of animals and I have a wider experience than many. But that doesn't put me above anybody else. And it certainly doesn't make me special for having animals that other people don't that I just find interesting that they may not. Lots of people don't find whip snakes interesting because they're what they call dull brown snakes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It doesn't make me special because I breed them. They're easy to breed. I, I've never sort of claimed any kind of um, superiority for it because they're just as easy to keep as many of the common species. I mean, if you put horseshoe whip snakes together, they're, they're, it's the same as keeping a corn snake, really. I mean, 
the difference is, is that many of these species are hardy under certain circumstances, shall we say. You couldn't keep many whip snakes in a tub. You couldn't keep many sam snakes in a tub. They just won't thrive. Right. I know that. I've tried it. I've actually imported um, some Ophis shokari in, in large numbers. I got quite a lot of them uh, around 2011 to the point that I had to keep some of them in fornariums, which are the, the clear plastic tubs with the mesh lids. Yeah, yeah. And above those, I had UV. And I put some in tubs. The ones in tubs on a heat pad just were not thriving. They wouldn't feed. They were just literally droning, curled up under a, a piece of wood. They did not come out. They weren't acting like these snakes are supposed to act, which is alert, inquisitive, periscoping up and looking at you, whereas the ones under UV in the fornariums did. And that convinced me that right there and then, these snakes don't do well in tubs. They've got to be all put into these fornariums, and they all picked up, and I still have many of them now. You know, some of them are in the, in the vivs at the back. Um, so breeding these animals, it can be done. Raising some of them is a different matter. I mean, some of these whip snakes, they're lizard specialists as, as youngsters, so it can be difficult raising them. But actually getting them to breed, I don't think that's an excuse for substandard welfare. I'm, I'll pick my words carefully because I don't want to alienate people. Mm -hmm. We're all in the same hobby and we all like the animals. Yeah. Message here is that there are better ways of doing things. Now, if a breeder is is got a livelihood of, you know, that it that is won by breeding these animals, I can't judge that. That's their livelihood. You know what I mean? That doesn't mean that the way they're doing things is the best for the animals. Correct. There's a, there's a trade-off. You're doing the best for yourself. And you're 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 making a profit, which I understand. People have to make a profit. You can't have. 200 vids with uv and expect to make a profit i sink thousands into my hobby but that's fine because it's a hobby yeah. if i was to, to you know if i was looking to make money from it i wouldn't be able to make a profit from doing it this way i'm not interested in making a profit but you know if people choose to make a profit that's fine but the fallacy is is that they're saying that this is also the best way of keeping them it yeah. isn't it's as simple as that and that's not opinion that's fact that's that's demonstrable by you know many many scientific reviews um assessing all kinds of things um space the availability of light types of heat enrichment at this point there is so much research that has gone on, gone on across such a large variety of taxa it can't be argued people will always reach for like the small fossorial species yeah maybe if you're breeding worm lizards or burrowing snakes maybe you don't need uv I've seen Amphisbanians once, only once, but I've seen an Amphisbanian out crossing the road. I've seen Samboas basking in the wild. So you can't tell me again that they never bask. Maybe yeah. there are mechanisms where they can retain serum D3 longer. Maybe there are. I don't know. I don't think it's been studied. But my outlook is you should offer them the choice and let them decide in that state. But yeah, exactly. Well, and, and I wonder even if, you know, if you're breeding in a more enriching environment, how much more, you know, productivity you might have as well, right? You might end up with, with a higher quantity of eggs. I don't know. That's more of a speculation. But I have an know. anecdote about that. Now, one okay, thing go that ahead. I found, um, and again, this is with corn snakes. So the simplest snakes of all, the one that many people start with, but I keep many corn snakes. I rehome <laughs> too many corn snakes for my own good. I like corn snakes. They're very nice animals and they make fantastic display animals. My corn snakes are kept with UV. They're kept with the type of heating that I espouse. And what I've noticed, and again, there are other reasons which I'll go into, and, and you can pick the one that you think. But what I find with the animals that are kept with UV, UV is that the eggs are slightly larger. Fewer eggs, though, funnily enough. Um, hmm. I've never had a clutch size with corn snakes above about 17, although I have had them double clutch, even when a male hasn't been reintroduced. Um, so usually double clutching will occur when the animal is physiologically prepared to do it. You know, I, I don't believe in enforcing them to mate multiple times. Um, right. Now I've had these corn snakes and I've taken them down to the shop to sell because I tend to sell most of my animals at, at, at the shop. Um, and I've taken the hatchling snakes, which have had like one feed or two feeds. And they're the size of animals that have been at the shop for months. It could be that that's down to UV. UV enables calcium metabolism so that may affect the mother's ability to make larger eggs perhaps 
It could also be that I breed my snakes later. I take great care to never breed a female before she's four years old, at least, sometimes even more. That could be an issue. Um, it could be that I've just got healthier snakes. You know, that, that there are many possible reasons for this. But the fact is that when I, I've bred these corn snakes, I'm taking the shop, the, the young are larger than the ones that have been at the shop for longer. So the, the, the younger animals are larger than the older animals. Why is that? Could it be that UV is affecting that? It's a possibility. I'm not going to guarantee it because it's not been empirically studied, but I believe that it, it can certainly affect it. Um, and when you see what UV and D3 does, when it comes it to sense. information and so on, it, it, it's a possibility. You know, Just as when you say, does UV affect growth rate? It's not been outright proven. It's been suggested in two papers. But again, UV um, allows D3 to be made. D3 allows metabolism of calcium. Calcium is used for bone growth. So it, it follows that possibly there'd be a bigger growth rate. I mean, there are two studies that I know of that have tested it in corn snakes. One was by uh, a lady called Abigail Nail, uh, and the other was published in the Rattel, the journal Rattel. And both of them have tested that. And I think one of them found no correlation between growth rate and UV, and one found that there was a correlation between growth rate and UV. So it's still in the air, but it, it's a possibility that makes sense. It's something that, that you can think about. One thing I will say is that, again, under UV, if we're going to talk about the benefits of UV, I mean, I've never had egg binding ever. Wow, that's amazing. And I, you know, I've been keeping for many years. Now, I've had snakes come in gravid that have had dystochia, that I've had to have the eggs aspirated, but I've never had one of my long-term snakes have egg binding. There are two reasons that I can think of that. One of them is UV. The second is that I don't keep them in tubs. But then again, I have had snakes in tubs and I never used to get it then either. But the tubs I used were large in comparison to the snake. Whilst I did used to keep snakes in tubs, they were big tubs in comparison to the snake. I never crammed them in. So it could be a um, movement thing as well, right? Yeah, I, I believe that dystochia is at least sometimes caused by just muscle atrophy. And you can see this with many snakes. I mean, one of the things that I'm often is often said by tub keepers is you can't tell the difference between a snake that's been raised in a tub and one that's been raised with. I disagree. You can. Not only has that difference been shown in rat snakes to the point that independent discriminant function analysis have actually been able to sort snakes just by their behavior that have been kept in enriched closures, enclosures and spartan setups i mean this was done by i believe lynn almley and gordon Burghardt at least once so not only has that been shown empirically you can see it in the body condition of the snake and, and many of my friends like for example melissa bear also swears to this as well if you've got a snake that is in an enclosure that's large enough for it to move from one end to the other climb of course it's got better muscle condition than one than one that's been kept in a really small tub and i've been to uh, sort of collect twin spotted rat snakes which are a, a small Chinese rat snake species that they're not exactly rare, but they're not very common either. And the ones that I went to collect were kept in small tubs. I mean, the snakes were only were twice as long as the tub and they were flaccid. They had no muscle condition whatsoever. Compare that with mine, which they feel like whip cord, you know, they're strong. You can yeah. feel them they're, they're as they should feel. They've got strong muscle um, strength and, and body tone. You can feel the difference between the snake. So yeah, I'm sure that if the muscle condition is that bad, if they're kept in tubs that small, then I'm sure that the egg binding must happen because the snake might not be strong enough to to lay a large crush, uh, a clutch. You know, and and you see these big breeder channels, and I've seen several of these channels dealing with egg binding. So I mean, yes. they do it does happen with them. I've never experienced that. So is that a symptom of the way they're being kept, or is it simply because they're keeping far more snakes? I don't know. It's again, it's something to think about. Yeah, um, no, totally. And, you know, I, I had somebody message me a couple of days ago and was saying, you know, I, I got into snakes. I, I started watching YouTube and following these big breeders who are very, you know, romanticized breeding snakes and whatnot. And, you know, he set himself up with a rack, but now he's discovered the, the, the podcast and Liam's work and Joseph's work and, and Harvey and whatnot and realized, hey, I need to go into a different direction. So he's asking me, like, do you think I can still run a breeding project having more enriching enclosures? And, and I think the answer is obviously yes. And there actually could be there's going to be some benefits on the welfare side for sure, but there might be other benefits like you're saying here, which is really yeah. interesting. Well, I mean, it's not proven, but I certainly believe it. Um, 
and isn't it great though that the effect that these videos are having where people exactly. who, who believe one thing and are open-minded enough to say you know what hey that's that might be interesting i've always said and this is especially with snake keepers it, it has to be said I, I find it happens more with snake keepers although also leopard geckos suffer as well there are two types of keeper the, one is the type of keeper that will argue ferociously when presented with new information that might benefit the animal so i've always done it this way they're fine okay yeah. sometimes there's no reaching that sometimes you can have a a civil debate and that's great sometimes they just don't want to hear it the other type of keeper is the kind of keeper that hears a new piece of information and thinks wow that's really interesting oh i might try that if it's a benefit for the animal i'm at least going to give it the benefit of the doubt and try it that's all that we're asking at the end of the day if at the end of the day if you care about the animal then anything that should that may benefit it benefit that animal should be of interest and this is yes. why i say i'm a pet keeper I'm not a breeder. I don't have any skin in the game. I don't have any money to be made. I, I, I sink a lot of money myself. It's like, I'm interested in the animals. If it benefits them, then I'm willing to give it at least, uh, you know, to hear it and perhaps try it out. Exactly. And I, I have noticed big changes. The other thing, again, sticking with UV um, and the benefits, something that's quite topical, respiratory infections. Mm -hmm. So one of the UV, it's always used because, it's always brought up in the context of MBD. Uh, metabolic bone disease because uv when it hits a skin causes a reaction where wherein through a series of chain reactions it will form vitamin d3 which allows um, calcium to be metabolized amongst other things and will help prevent uh, mbd by you know allowing the animal to form healthy bones and so on but it does so much else um yeah. that is never brought up. And, and obviously, I understand why MBD is brought up because it used to be so common in bearded dragons and leopard geckos. It's horrible to see an animal that's suffering from it. So yeah, I understand that's going to be the thing that most people latch onto because hobbyists can literally see it. Everyone's got a story about seeing this horribly sort of gecko that's like got its arms and fingers all bent and twisted. Its lower jaw is, you know, it, it looks horrible. It's a distressing yes. thing to see. Um, but nobody seems to know that D3 and, and UV prevents respiratory infection mm -hmm. to the point that, I mean, with the, the current pandemic, UV is, seems to be one of the things that inhibits the uh, COVID-19. Um, I mean, and again, Gibraltar, I've got to mention again, because there have been studies uh, funded by the Gibraltar Museum where they've actually found that, yeah, there are actually uh, bats, for example, um, the different kinds of bats, the ones that are exposed to UV are less likely to suffer COVID or to carry COVID. Um, people that have more access to UV and higher D3 are less likely to get severe effects from COVID. It's, it's interesting. And it applies to a tub. Again, if, if you look in reptile forums, I mean, I've been members of various reptile forums for 20 years now. Um, King Snake, you know, Captive Red Forums, Ball Pythons Net, uh, Reptile Forums UK, all the Facebook forums, Dart Frog or Dotter. One of the most common things that you'll see with, especially with royal pythons, but with other snakes as well, respiratory infections. Mm -hmm. I've never experienced one um, under UV. Now, again, is this because of the tub? There are various reasons it might be. Is it because they don't have access to UV? It could be. We know that there is a, uh, a connection between the amount of UV and D3 and how likely it is to suffer from respiratory infection. Like it's one of the things that D3 does. Is it because there's too much humidity in these tubs? Is it because snakes have only got one functioning lung? I mean, some of the older books that you might read will say that it needs a long enclosure it can stretch out in because otherwise it will get a respiratory infection. This is kind of forgotten law now. Yes. Uh, when people, you know, you hear the argument saying, oh, people have been doing this for decades. Actually, tub keeping is quite recent. It, it only really started in the late 90s uh, and early 2000s. Before that, you won't find many mentions of tubs. I mean, the, the book I mentioned from 1987, it doesn't mention tubs at all. It mentions vivs. It gives you specific uh, sizes of vivs, which actually tally up with the, the minimum recommended sizes that we espouse today, two thirds of the length of the snake. Um, you won't see reticulated pythons being recommended for six foot vivs. They're not, they're, they, they quite like strongly state these need room sized enclosures. Yeah. When people say people have been doing this for a long time, they haven't. Actually, most of the old books say quite the opposite. Um, you know, 
that's not to say that everything is accurate in them, but in certainly in, in terms of size of vivs, I think that the minimum sizes have constricted quite a lot in, yes. in, in those decades. Well, and exactly. And yeah, over time, it's getting smaller and smaller, especially with these rack companies putting out you know, tighter racks and whatnot. And yeah. and just like you say, the, the fact that, and I was just looking at it on something on Facebook today, there was people arguing about a, a rack and you, you get the comments, well, I've been doing this for 20 years and it's fine. It's like, well, the fact that they're breeding is not a mark of success. Like you're saying, they're easy to breed. So congratulations, you put two snakes together and now you have babies. I'm never going to put down people breeding their animals that's great. It's 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 a it's a, a worthy achievement. It's something that everyone gets excited over. Of course, I, I love it when I've got eggs incubated. You can't wait for them to be laid, and, and you can't wait for that prelay shed, and you you know you can't wait for them to start pipping and hatching, and those little faces come out. It's a great thing, but it's not the pinnacle or zenith of keeping. Yeah, it isn't because two mating animals, they don't even have to be healthy to mate. I've had animals come in um, that have been mating snakes, literally locked in cloth bags full of other snakes. I've driven philodrys baroni across europe so that, so you've, the animals have been taken to the show however long that has taken from another country they've sat over a weekend in a box at the show at, at whatever hotel the seller is using they've been bought by me put into a, a bus driven for eight hours carried on a ferry put into a car driven for another three hours and they're mating like right, i'm sorry but it's like that's not really <laughs> ideal conditions is it so yeah. if you're saying that it's gonna be such ideal conditions why are they locked exactly you know, um it, it, it all falls down to what welfare means i mean if we talk about mating as an indication of welfare well it isn't and the orian society has produced a bunch of papers across again a diversity of taxes so i know that it's been shown in green turtles in marine and green iguanas i think in in a species of monitor in king snakes in rattlesnakes and in garter snakes that actually periods of long-term stress such as drought result in a higher breeding drive that's not what would normally happen when an animal is under long-term chronic stress it, it shouldn't happen um, under mammalian norms that isn't what happens but for reptiles i mean there is a biological prerogative for that if you're in a an area where you are you have a stressful environment an environment that doesn't meet your requirements then the biological prerogative to to reproduce kicks in if you're having more young then more then there's more likelihood that at least some of those young will reach adulthood in that stressful environment so yes breeding isn't necessarily an indication of welfare it's it's the same with when people say oh they're eating they're shedding and they're pooping i mean those are normal things if it's not doing one of those then it must be really ill <laughs> yeah, exactly. i've seen plenty of ill animals that eat shed and poop and then they've been pretty badly off i mean you, yeah. you can't really just use that as an indication of welfare yeah you wouldn't buy an animal that wasn't doing one of those things but it's not automatically an assumption that it's a pretty low place healthy. to set the bar yeah, <laughs> they're, they're, yeah. i mean there's that you certainly can't say that they cannot be healthier than that because they can yeah um the problem is, is that as keepers, most of us don't have the, the qualification or the means to either identify or to assess whether or not they're healthy. I mean, you know, we're not going to go out and measure glucocorticoids or corticosteroids in the animal's blood. We're not going to be able to test its feces or skin for, for the same thing. We're not going to be able to measure its leukocyte count. We can't do that. I mean, unless we're taking the animals to vets to test that. You, you, you can't really say that it's as healthy as it could be or that it isn't under stress. Um, so I, I do find that somewhat intriguing, the way people just use that as a benchmark for welfare. It, it's yeah. not, that's not how welfare is measured. Um, Have you... Yeah, I, I completely agree. It's it's amazing how people do that. And as far as breeding goes, have you, have you ever tried a maternal incubation or do you always use an incubator or have you messed around with that at all? I haven't, actually. I, I, I have been asked... Um, most species I keep don't incubate maternally. I mean, I've had royal pythons, but again, I've just incubated those as that was the done thing. Um, I'd be interested in trying it if I ever kept one of those species again. Um, mm. But to be honest, it, it, it's similar to the whole bioactive thing. Sometimes it is easier just to take the eggs and, and incubate them because you want to, to keep things as simple as possible. Um, so for example, I mean, the way I incubate eggs is quite an old fashioned way. I don't use, uh, unless it's a desert species, which require dry environments. I tend to use tubs 
which are half full of water with an aquarium heater in. You set the aquarium heater to the required temperature and then you suspend the eggs over the water on women's tights, which are then sort of fastened in place with an elastic band. You close the box and you've got perfect humidity inside. Um, and then you open it every few days to shake off the excess. It's, it's pretty... Uh, stone age solution but i found that it works really really well for anything except the the desert species it, it didn't work all that well for some office so for those i use the more traditional means um, but that, that's the way i incubate eggs and, and it's worked really well for me so as far as we kind of mentioned earlier brumation how, are you you put your animals through brumation i think and how are you doing that like you said it's you know the temperature in the room is not going to get low enough so what do you do for that okay so I follow quite a long guide for that because brumation is triggered by not just temperature drop, by also by light. Mm. Um, so the animals, I mean, you can see that, that I think a few of the tanks behind me are, are off. So I start by reducing daylight hours. That's the obvious thing. If, if you're manipulating light, then that's the easiest thing to do. So you reduce the, the daylight hours throughout no October and November by an hour each side. So in the morning, they go on an hour later and in the evening, they go an hour earlier off. You stop switching the lights on, uh, rather the heaters on. So the light will still be on, but the heater won't. Um, and you stop feeding them, obviously. And then over a period of weeks, so every week you'll adjust that by a few hours. Um, depending on species, so for example, the really, the species like Russian rat snakes, Korean rat snakes, Dion's, black rat snakes, and so on, those types of snakes that experience really massive winter drops, they go in the fridge. And if they're too big for the fridge, I mean, some of the Russian rat snakes have got a uh, seven feet long, so you can't fit one in the fridge. Then they'll go out into my shed in my mother's garden. Um, it's not necessarily as cold as I want it to be, but if they're in a big enough box, uh, we're talking an 84 litre tub full of soil of dead leaves, it, it's frost free. And yeah, there'll be variation in, um, in temperature, but as long as it stays beneath about 12 degrees, which usually it does, they brumate. Um, for species such as uh, the Iberian whip snakes, horseshoe whip snakes, and so on, some of the Greek species, Egyptian, I don't fully brumate them, I just cool them. So I'll stop switching the heater on. Uh, and again, this is what I'm saying with room temperature. Room temperature, 22 degrees is winter temperature in, in many places in, in, you know, in the Mediterranean or Egypt. Right. Yes, it can get colder and get down to seven degrees, but there are also days when it goes up to 22. You know, I've, uh, in Gibraltar, you can go out on a sunny day and you see snakes out and about even in December. Um, so it comes down as well to knowing the type of um, spermatogenesis that these species go. I and mean, we're getting deep into it now. But so there's there's different types of spermatogenesis that different animals go through. You've got prenuptial spermatogenesis, which is when it occurs in one year. The spermatogenesis formation of sperm in the male occurs during the breeding season itself. Then you've got postnuptial spermatogenesis, which occurs after mating and the sperm is stored during the winter. So that, for example, the Eurasian adders, they do that. Um, you've got some that have continuous activity, like they'll breed continuously over the years. Um, so depending on the type of spermatogenesis that the animal goes through, that will determine whether or not it, I brumate it, you know, for, and how long I brumate it for. So, for example, if we're talking about horseshoe whip snakes, I keep going back to them because they're a species I'm very familiar with. They're basically limited in their distribution to areas that it doesn't get so cold that they have to hibernate. I mean, they, they do brew, they do go into cooling in places like northern Portugal. I mean, Mark Harris has, has them hibernating and so on. But they don't do it for long, and they complete their spermatogenesis in one year. In any place where they get really long winters, uh, so above a certain um area in southern france you won't get them because they can't undergo this uh, spermatogenesis in one year mm. those get cooled they, they could be uh, hibernated and, and i have uh, at various times tried hibernating them as well but a cooling period is fine for them for animals like dion's rat snake russian rat snakes those won't be fertile without a long period of hibernation i mean russian rat snakes in some areas of the primorsky they hibernate nearly six months of the year five to six months these are animals that are adapted to, to brumate, to hibernate. Now, if you don't do that, it, is it going to affect the animal? It's up in the air. I mean, I have my thoughts on that. But if you try and breed it, the eggs are very unlikely to be fertile. And I've found that if without hibernation, those species of rats make won't, aren't likely to produce fertile eggs. Further, 
there have been studies on on snakes now i mean black rat snakes are one there's also i believe a, a paper that had noteki so tiger snakes in southern australia uh, rattlesnakes and garter snakes and they were all tested and without brumation they don't live as long now the the longest term one was on black rat snakes which are pretty analogous to a, a lot of the rat snakes i keep here if you look at the range of black rat snake in you know they, they've got quite a big range all the way up into canada in some parts of that range they don't hibernate and in some parts they hibernate for a very long period what they found was that in the areas where they don't hibernate they'll breed younger so the females will breed at around four years old but they live 10 years less than wow. the animals that were hibernating and breeding later so the animals in canada breed at seven years old that's, that's quite a difference but they live to up to 30 years as opposed to 20 year lifespans for the for the animals that don't brumate it makes perfect sense yeah i mean they've got that period of the year where they you know their their bodies are allowed to cool down and and slow down their metabolism so for me yes if the animal would brumate in the wild i make sure that it brumates uh here and you actually have you kind of mentioned earlier but i know i was flipping through your instagram the other day and I, you have some pictures of it you have some very senior snakes in your collection and very. that is something <laughs> like there's two things about your collection that i love one is animals that you don't see a lot it's not full of you know corn snakes and ball pythons not that those aren't great but it's nice to see different species and then two older animals and that's something that we don't see in the hobby we always see you know hatchlings and babies and one year or two year old but all of these animals live so long it's nice yeah. to see these animals staying in a collection so tell me about I, some of the older snakes so i mean the oldest ones that i've got at the moment so the ones that spring to mind i mean a lot of the animals i got in the 90s when i came over i've still got so russian rat snakes i've got that are in excess of 20 odd years 25 years uh dion's rat snakes which are tiny little snakes they're only like two to three feet long usually and i've got some of those that are 26 to 27 years old which may i'm not sure I'd, you'd, you'd have to confer with someone like sergey ryabov from the tula serpentarium but may be a longevity record in captivity i don't know i don't know anyone that's kept them as long as that um so i'm not saying that they are but they're, the, they're in the, they're they're in the fight of, yeah. yeah um japanese rat snakes i've got way too many japanese rat snakes they, they never seem to die they're just <laughs> unkillable um <laughs> Uh, Philodryas baroni. Um, I was one of the first people in Europe to actually start breeding those regularly around 97, 98. Um, I was lucky to get some. I, I got a pair around 2002 from Crystal Palace Reptiles that had come from Germany, who I think was from the breeder that was actually the first to, uh, to start breeding them. There were records of that species being bred before that. So, for example, if you look at um, Ludwig Trutnau's book, he had them, but that was in America. America, I believe, but in Europe, I was one of the ones that started that craze. I mean, they're very hardy snakes, they're easy to breed. But in the UK, at least, if you haven't directly imported a Philodryas from Europe, which is unlikely, mo most of them come from Europe now, they're, they're very widely kept now, then there's a good likelihood that it's actually descended from my animals, which I love. Um, so I've got some of those that are, you know, 23, 24. I mean, one of them have got has like no nose left. Normally, the species has like a little rubbery sort of point on the nose and, and it's so old that that's just gone <laughs> um boiga cyania the green cat-eyed snakes i've had those since around 2000 so they're getting on 20 years old some of them um but yeah i mean of my collection it's not that i never get new snakes i do um but not often because my collection is so big that i don't have the room now keeping in the way i do means that there's a limited amount of space so i've got to be very careful what i purchase because I will have that. I mean, at this point, I'm nearly 40. If I buy a snake now, I'll have it by the time that I retire, most likely. Yeah. You know, that's what we're looking at. These animals live for 20 to 30 years. Um, so most of my collection is more than 15 years old. Uh, and when we, come, when we talk about snakes, and a good deal of those are, are more than 20 now. I mean, when I, when I look back, it seems like yesterday. But, you know, such a large number of animals that I've got were bought around 2002, 2000, 98, you know, some of them 1995. Uh, and I, I, you know, these these are animals that live a long time. Uh, and not just snakes, geckos. I've got geckos that are 20 years old as well. So I would say this to any prospective reptile keeper. If you're going to buy a reptile as a pet, these are animals that live longer than cats and dogs, which is amazing, you know, for such small animals. Um, be prepared for that. Be prepared to yeah. not just have it in a small tub for the whole of that time, which would be really sad. Some of these animals um, I've had in tubs 
and I think back, I mean, many species that I kept in tubs, I've never kept in naturalistic terraria. And I, I regret that, you know, I regret not experiencing them mm-hmm. because seeing the difference between, for example, the Japanese rat snakes, it, it makes me emotional now when I see them, you know, knowing that the first 10 years of their life, they were kept in a small tub and the second 10 years of their life and, and beyond, they've been kept in a viv where they can climb and, and you know, the amount of that they move and climb around it's a different quality of life. I'm sorry, you know, people can argue it, but it, it really is a different thing to allow it to bask and to see it moving from a humid area to a, a dry area, flattening itself out under the heater, basking under the UV, stretching out, which is another contentious thing that people say snakes don't do. I'm sorry, they do. They stretch out all the damn time. Yeah, uh, I can walk into my room at any time and see several of them sort of luxuriantly stretched out along their branches. They do it a lot. Um, Curiously, I noticed that they often do it along the the UV bulb. So, mm. you know, I don't know if that's coincidence or not, but often I'll see them stretch out under a UV bulb, you know, and it's not just the, the lubricants, like the, the boas do it too. Um, yeah. So when people say they don't stretch out, maybe it's because you haven't given them the opportunity to do it. <laughs> yeah, if it's in a tiny all shoe of is able to do it, I see it a lot. It's not just, it's not even an occasional thing. Every day you can come in and you'll see them stretched out, you know, Obviously, they're not going to be in a point, you know, completely, you know, the whole <laughs> vertebral column like a, a flagpole, but yeah. they will stretch. You know, there's there's no denying that they will. And if you find them in the wild, quite often they are as well. Yeah. You know. Well, and, and who knows how much, I mean, it's probably obvious, but in, as far as the longevity goes, keeping them in that environment, you're probably adding, it could be a decade to their life. I hope so. I, I You know, I, I can't say that. That kind of study would be a very, very long-term type of study when you think mm-hmm. about it, 30 years. Uh, I would hope so. I would say that the longest lived snakes that we know of, the pythons, like, were not kept in tubs. When you look at the royal pythons that were kept in the Philadelphia Zoo, um, you know, the, the records of like 47, I think somebody's mentioned 60 um, recently, those snakes had access to sunlight. Yeah. You know, they, they weren't just kept in a tub, they were kept in a zoo enclosure. Does that mean that others keeping them in tubs haven't kept them a long time? Well, I, I've heard of people that have kept them in tubs until their 20s, so that's good going. Um, it's not as long as they can live. If you've got an animal that can live up to 40 or 50, then 20 is barely middle-aged. Exactly. Um, but it's still a nice, it's good going. I mean, uh, there, there are certain breeders that I've heard publicly say that their females are living eight to 10 years. I'm not going to name them, but that's atrocious. That's bad. That, that's really bad. Um, I think he kind of like slipped that out on one video once and it always stuck with me. But yeah, if, you're, if your Royal Python is only living eight to 10 years, there's a problem in your husbandry. That's uh, a kid, maybe, basically. Yeah. Maybe you're overbreeding it. Who knows? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, and it's so true. Like I have a crested gecko behind me that's 15 years old. And it's just one of those weird things in the hobby where you see a, a little kid be, being given a crested gecko and you wonder, that thing should theoretically be with that child if, if for that individual for, you know, 20 years. Yeah. But and it's almost like that's one of the problems with the hobby is that we have so many long living animals. And I think seeing someone like yourself have these animals and actually keep them for that long is so huge because we don't want it to turn into a merry-go-round of you know shuffling animals around yeah I'm, i don't approve of that like i say i'm a pet keeper there are people who want to breed there are people that maybe want to keep animals for limited periods and so on. i can't judge on that everyone is different you know but for me these animals are pets yes breeding is nice but I could never, for example, if we talk about breeding projects, yeah, I could have a whole room full of Dion's rat snakes, and I'd like to. They're, they're lovely animals, and they, there's enough variety. But I also like the variety. I like having one or two of different species. So, yeah, there are mm-hmm. plenty of animals I've only got one of. Um, I'd like to have more for some of them, but sometimes they're just too rare to come by. There are other animals I've got, you know, maybe 10 or 12 of. I mean, Dion's rat snakes and, and Japanese rat snakes, I'm up to my hips in them because they just, uh, you know, I, just, I keep sort of, breeding them and they don't seem to sell to the point that nowadays like japanese rat snake eggs i actually use as food for other animals which mm-hmm. it always causes consternation um it, among some people but it's a valuable source of food i mean i've got videos of some of my other whip snakes and coach whips eating the eggs it's another form of enrichment um, yeah, and absolutely. Enough, if you don't want to breed them why make them and let them lay well i cycle them um as if they would breed as if they're breeding animals i don't breed them every year so, you know, some of these animals only breed every two years. But if you're cycling the animal, if it is healthy enough, it has a drive to mate as well. And not to mention not breeding them can sometimes cause issues. So when you see things like dystochia, um, egg binding and so on, that can sometimes be caused by not breeding. Uh, I mean, uh, Al Stotton, who is a, a, a nice guy who breeds Pituophis a lot, 
has also said the same thing that it, it's not necessarily healthy to not allow the animals to breed. Um, and when you think about it, if you're talking about enrichment, well, one of the main drives of these animals is to mate. Yes. There's no two ways about it. The males go, you know, they come out of hibernation like runaway locomotives. They're just looking for something to, to basically plow. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, exactly. so, um, you know, I'll let them breed if it's an animal that I don't think that I'm going to sell or I've just got lots of or that I, I'm not going to want to keep myself then. If, if I've got eggs, then they're an extra source of food. Um, I'm not going to be, get rich treating it that way, but that was never my intent. As I say, I'm a pet keeper. Exactly. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. And I do sometimes wonder if, if you're not breeding your males, like I have a male boa who I've never bred and, I, and the same thing during breeding season, he's cruising around up there and he's kind of going crazy. And I always, often yeah. wonder like how much am I, you know, holding back from his potential of his life by not letting him mate. I mean, funnily enough, it was actually a tub keeper that put that to me about a decade ago that actually said that. And it, it did hit home. It said, you know what? He's right. You know, I may not agree with everything that, that he he does, but actually he's right. If you're not allowing the animal to reproduce then that's one of its main drives um so yes you know i think that you you can't really look at a male deer and rat snake just out of hibernation and think yeah that doesn't want to breed i mean the way that they are they get so excited and they try and mate with everything is like yeah that that really really has a uh, <laughs> a sex drive that that needs to be sort of uh, satisfied yeah, exactly. Well, we've had a the great conversation here. We'll kind of slowly start to wrap up. Um, I, as far as the hobby, were, is there any areas that you think right now you would love to see improvement on? I know we've covered a lot of them already, but is there anything that we haven't covered that, that you think we should? I think that slowly and surely things are getting better. It's very easy to get frustrated. And I, I'm, believe me, I do. I get very frustrated with seeing all the online arguments and, and the way things are kept. But it is refreshing and it is it does give hope to see videos such as from yourself, Liam Sinclair, Joseph Brabin, Harvey Tweets, uh, Chaz from Snakes and Adders also mm -hmm. does some amazing husbandry videos. The improvement, it happens slowly. I mean, we set up the, a group called Advancing Herpetological Husbandry. I was one of the co-founders of that, specifically to dispel hobby myths. And there are many hobby myths. You know all of them. Geckos will burn up if you put them in light. Snakes mm -hmm. need small spaces substrate causes impaction um there's hundreds of them the idea behind that was to use science and evidence to disprove those myths and to to show that there is a better way of doing things there are other groups that have done that too reptile lighting uh, roman murin and, and francis brains are fantastic at giving information far more patiently than i do i must say <laughs> <laughs> um so things are getting better and it is it does give hope to see videos like uh, the ones that the your other guests have given being disseminated the way they are and and i think that the the ahh peer review has been important in that too i think that's a very good thing the fact that we're actually getting established um you know scientific authorities on various subjects to review these videos give feedback and and get them edited so that they have a seal of approval that's peer review that, that's how peer yeah. reviewed science is done so you're getting experts in their field to actually look at these videos and say, well, that's wrong, that's good. And they're being edited as a result. And, you know, they're offering contribution to it. I think that's fantastic. And I think that that will go a long way to disproving some of the, you know, the half-truths that you see in the hobby. I think currently the big thing, that the big hoo-ha that's going on is sizes of enclosures. I mean, in previous mm -hmm. years, when I've been asked, I've always said heating and lighting. But you know what? heating and lighting is being covered uh, and i see the improvement in that day by day the way things are heated the the types of heat that are offered you know the, the the types of infrared the types of light you know full spectrum uv we've got so many companies catering to that we're, we're almost spoiled for for choice and there are so many resources online now i mean you can actually talk directly to francis baines an authority on the subject and she will advise you i mean how amazing is that I think space is the next one that is, mm -hmm. is going to be the big um, hoo-ha. I mean, for me personally, for snakes, I think the bigger the better, but a minimum of enclosure size as long as the snake is. Not for the specious reasons that you see some of these animal rights groups produce. There's, you know, there may not be a physiological need for them to stretch out. That's debatable. They do do it, but that doesn't mean they must do it or that they can't survive without it. But just the fact that having giving them that amount of space makes it easier for them to not just to exercise, but to give them these gradients in heat, in light, in, in humidity that we know helps them. Yeah. Um, 
I think minimum standards are slowly getting better. I mean, it was suggested by the vet uh, Tarek, um, mm -hmm. I forgot his name, uh, Tarek Abdu. I can't remember his name. Very nice guy, though, and a, an extremely uh, worthwhile video to watch. Um, I'll make sure I put that video in the show notes. I know what you're talking about. You can go yeah, ahead. It, it's a fantastic, well thought out video. Mm -hmm. And he he uses the uh, the size of three quarters of the length of the snake. Now, mm -hmm. I'd prefer bigger, but you know what? You can compromise. That there, there, there has to be some give and take in this hobby. Not everyone is going to be of the same mind. But if you can show the lay people who are the ones who are going to be whose opinions are going to be affected by the animal rights campaigns and so on, that actually the hobby is doing its what it can to improve. If you're saying that, look, we are showing minimum size guidelines that are more in line with evidence and that we are sort of disenfranchising ourselves from this idea that having a, a python in a, in a small tub or a 15-foot snake in a six-foot viv is okay, that's all you can do. I mean, obviously... I don't think people need to justify keeping reptiles. I do think that sometimes they must justify how they keep them. Yes. Uh, and I, I, I say that a lot. Um, so yes, I think size is the next thing that, that is going to be tackled uh, quite a lot. Um, I, I know that there are lots of um, studies going on behind the scenes at places uh, you know, where they're looking into how that affects their behavior and physiology. I think you'll see at least in the UK, again, the, the UK and the US are completely different beasts uh, in the way that the public sort of regards the hobby and the way that hobbyists themselves treat mm -hmm. it. I think it's much easier to affect change in the UK as it's smaller. Um, yeah. I think it's, it's the US is seeing some improvement. We've seen that just in the last five years. It's slower and there's sometimes more stubborn resistance. But, you know, that's because there are more people in the hobby and a wider spread of opinions and characters. But for example, I mean, nobody knows who I am. I'm Francis Cascari. Like, you know, who gives a, you know, who cares what I say, you know, keeping blue. But when you've got someone like Tom Crutchfield, who's also espousing these beliefs, you can't say that he hasn't been keeping enough to know what he's talking about. You can't say that he's not well known enough to say, well, that's just your opinion, man. It's like, it's Tom bloody Crutchfield. You're like, exactly. What, what he hasn't done in the hobby isn't worth doing. So he is also out there saying the same thing people will start to uh, to take more notice, you know. Yeah, and, and he's actually pr somewhat active in the AH he is, yes. group as well, uh, which is really cool. Nice I'm, I'm looking forward to meeting him at the next uh, American AHH meet that we do. But sadly, and, and, we weren't able to do one this year because of COVID, but normally we do a, a meet, one in America and one in the UK, uh, which is usually a fantastic, um, se you know, it's got a series of seminars over a two-day period. It, it's usually a fantastic uh, opportunity to learn from like real experts yeah i would love to I, I i really do hope that within the next year or so things straighten out and we can actually do one of those uh, in this part of the world and i would love to yeah. to go yeah. to one because the, i think it would be amazing was the uh, the arizona one of Chir uh, chiricahua uh, desert if i've said if i'm butchered the name uh there was one that was going to be done in st louis zoo which would have been nice because you'd have seen that the snake road um but that was one that got cancelled sadly so i don't know what the whether it's the plan is to have it in the same place next year or not but you know, as as the the world turns and this epidemic goes away, we'll um, we'll start advertising. You know, when we know more. Yeah, and if anyone is interested, they can just be part of the the advancing herpetological husbandry Facebook group, and that's I'm sure will be posted. And you're actually quite active in there as well. You actually do take the time to really write out these thorough responses to people, which I I just don't have the patience to type things out. But you do. I, I go through stages. I go through stages where sometimes I just lose patience and I try and just ignore. And then I'll I'll come back and I'll just write a long response. And the thing is, you know, people will accuse me of writing essays or being elitist, but all I'm doing is I'm trying to give as detailed as an answer as possible. When it comes to keeping animals, it's what I was saying about these cookie cutter care sheets. You can't say, you can't distill the entirety of knowledge of keeping a, any species of animal onto a Facebook post. Mm -hmm. You can't, like, for example, if you're going to talk about cohabiting, which is always a, a spicy one, <laughs> well, yeah, you can cohabit, and some people have reason for not cohabiting, and they're good reasons, but you can't have just one Facebook post. I mean, Facebook, the, the, the post's length doesn't allow you to write enough. You could write a book on cohabiting. I mean, I have a standard response on Facebook that it takes five Facebook comments to do because of the, the word length, and that's just the beginning. That's just touching the iceberg. So you can't necessarily comment on Facebook 
the entirety of welfare of an animal. I don't like doing it. I mean, I write articles on particular species that I've had success with. And they're usually about 20 pages long. Mm-hmm. You know, that's a, a minimum, you know, to, to get what, you know, onto the entirety of care of a species. It, it's not a subject that you can't write essays about. I'm sorry. You know, you can give clipped answers if you want, but they'll never contain anywhere near like the spread of information or the full truth there'll always be an opinion or you know but so yes I, I, i'll write long answers they'll be argued over or taken on board at the end of the day all you can do is you know you can give the, uh, you know your own experience and, and knowledge and people can take it or leave it and you can quote scientists and peer-reviewed studies and again people can take it or leave it you know uh, if people are going to argue it i insist that if you're going to argue peer-reviewed science you have to counter with data of your own you can't just say well yes. no and leave it there or i've done it this way and it works i'm sure it works but that doesn't mean that it's as good as the other way that, that's the difference there's, there's this sort of thing where people will say well each to their own or everyone has their opinion or you know everyone's got their mm-hmm. own way of doing things that's fine and true but that doesn't mean that each way of doing things is the same it doesn't mean that one way isn't better than the other way um you know, I'm, and I'm sure one way is better for people wishing to mass breed them. I don't deny that. Mm-hmm. But if we're looking from the animal's perspective, and that's my interest. My interest is the animals and husbandry and welfare. People have their own reasons for cutting corners, and that's fine. I understand that. I'm not going to judge them for it. But I will give anyone reading the whole the lowdown. I will say, you know, yes, if you want to breed them, you can do it this way. But if you're interested in the welfare of the animals, there are better. There may be better ways of doing things. You know, you can take what you want. Nobody can go into your house and force you with a stick to adopt these methods of keeping. But if you're going to educate, you need to put everything out there, not just sort of little hand-picked opinions. Exactly. And as I always say, the animals will reward you when you make that move, which is the best part. Francis, thank you so much. This was uh, an amazing... We've gone way over time, which I kind of thought might happen, but... It's, it's a running that, team with me, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I think there's probably several episodes inside your head, so we'll, we'll start with this one, and that, that was fantastic. As far as where people can find you, I guess probably the best thing is the AHA Facebook yes. group? Yes. I'm always on Advancing Herpetological Husbandry. I don't admin on there anymore, but I did co-found the group, but I found... Maybe there are there are a less strong-willed minds, a better place for, for actually ab, admin duties, shall we say, <laughs> less fiery. <laughs> um, I, I also go on Instagram under the moniker Thrasops, although I like that just because I can share photos of my animals with, with less discussion and debate about it. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I'm always happy to answer emails. I, I do tend to miss a lot of emails in the junk mail, so I apologize for those that send me that I don't respond to quite as quickly as I'd like to. But uh, your, I mean, your Instagram page is awesome. So I'll make sure all of that is in the show notes for people and they can take a look at your animals and whatnot. And so thank you so much, uh, Francis. This was a pleasure. a pleasure. Thanks for having me. All right. That is the end of that episode. Francis, thank you so much for joining me. I know you have way more information in your head. So we're eventually going to have to do a part two and probably a part three and maybe a part four. But for now, that was a great way to start your journey on the Animals at Home podcast. To the listeners, thank you very much for listening. I hope you or actually I know you would have gathered some great information from that episode. If you did enjoy it, make sure you share it on Facebook or Instagram and tag me so I can thank you for that. And again, if you are looking for more information on this episode or the podcast network in general, head to animalsathomenetwork.com. You can find links to everything there. Thank you very much to customreptilehabitats.com, who is the sponsor of the podcast network. You can find links to them in the description, YouTube, or the show notes on animalsathomenetwork.com. Of course, those are affiliate links. So if you do pick up a piece of reptile equipment, a small commission does come back to me at no extra cost to you. And of course, that does help support the show. We've got some great episodes coming up in the future, so I do hope you are subscribed on one of your podcasting apps, whatever you use. Hit the subscribe button so you don't miss what is coming up. I will catch you guys in the next episode.